Therapy Chat Podcast, Episode 52. This is the Therapy Chat Podcast. The information shared in this podcast is not a substitute for seeking help from a licensed mental health professional. And now, here's Laura Reagan, LCSWC, with today's episode. back to Therapy Chat. Today's episode is a little bit different because September is Suicide Prevention Awareness Month and today is Friday, September 23rd and I'm going to be interviewing Dr. Jonathan Singer who is a professor at Loyola University in Chicago and the author of the book Suicide in Schools. Jonathan has worked for years in the field of suicidology, and so I wanted to talk to him about his work and his book and find out what we can learn during Suicide Prevention Awareness Month that will help us understand this mysterious and scary problem, which is taking too many lives. Today's episode is dedicated to Nick Moothart, who is my dear friend Sarah Linehan's brother, who passed away from suicide in December of 2013. Sarah has a fundraising page for the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention, Out of the Darkness Walk, which here in Annapolis is tomorrow, September 24th. To make a donation to Team Nick, go to my fundraising page for Team Nick, which you can access in the show notes for this episode. Whether you would like to donate to Team Nick or support the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention in another way, I hope you will consider making a donation to End Suicide, which is a problem that is just destroying families and certainly in my community here outside of Annapolis so many lives have been lost to suicide and I see the effects on both um, in my practice and in my personal life when people are left behind So let's go ahead and get started with my interview with Jonathan Singer, which I am releasing on the same day I record it. I usually don't do that. So I hope you'll enjoy it. And as always, thanks for listening to Therapy Chat. Hi, welcome back to Therapy Chat. Today, I'm very honored to be speaking with Dr. Jonathan Singer, who is a professor at Loyola University in Chicago and the one of the authors of the book, Suicide in Schools, A Practitioner's Guide. Jonathan, thank you so much for being on Therapy Chat. Laura, it is such an honor and a privilege to be here talking with you. Ah, thanks. Um, I would love for you to start off with just telling our audience a little bit more about yourself and your work. So I... I've been a social worker for 20 years. I graduated with my MSW in 1996. I realized that a couple of days ago. I was like, wait a minute, it's been 20 years. Um, and most of my time has been working with families in crisis, specifically families where there's a kid who's suicidal. Mm-hmm. And I, uh, I was in Austin, Texas, and I, I was doing outpatient community mental health, mobile crisis intervention, home-based family therapy, that sort of stuff. Uh, I started adjuncting at UT Austin, was inspired to go back get my PhD. I did that at the University of Pittsburgh. Um, I got a job at Temple University in Philadelphia. I was able to connect with Guy Diamond, who is one of the co-developers of attachment-based family therapy, um, which is the first family therapy that was developed for suicidal and depressed kids. I worked with him for three years on a uh, federally funded clinical trial of ABFT. It was an amazing experience. And then I I got a job at Loyola University in Chicago, and um, it's been a fantastic place to be, uh, incredibly supportive of my interest in uh, schools and suicide risk, as well as uh, the role of technology in um, kind of mediating social work practice. 
which reminds me that I very, I had a major omission by not mentioning that you are the host of the wonderful, wildly successful and long running podcast, the social work podcast, which is an indispensable resource for any social worker. Yes, thank you for the plug. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. And the social work podcast I started when I was a doctoral student at the University of Pittsburgh. And it was really, it was just kind of trying to meet the needs of my students. You know, I was teaching them these things about practice theories like CBT and, you know, uh, solution focused therapy and things like that. And I, and I, and I knew. Because, you know, I, I, I was a practitioner. I knew that this information was actually really, really essential to their practice. But they weren't practicing yet, so they didn't know how essential it was. And so the question is, well, how do I get them this information in an easily digestible format after they are no longer in my classroom? And the answer happened to be podcast, um, which had just been... Uh, I think the word podcast had been coined in 2004, and the iTunes store was in 2006, and then I started mine in January of 2007. And um, it really, it was it was it was intended to meet this need, and I feel very grateful that um, people have continued to uh, visit the podcast website and subscribe on iTunes and and do all the things that people do these days, and and. And I have to say, Laura, I mean, one of the things that I've also been just so delighted at is that there are other social workers and psychologists and counselors and LMFTs who in the last, uh, you know, three, four years have started podcasts and have been able to tackle issues and topics and have guests on that um, that I don't. And, and so I really feel like there is a community of social work or social or mental health podcasts, um, which is an incredible resource. And so I'm very grateful to be part of that. Yes, me too. And we met at podcast movement and got to know each other spent a good amount of time together there. So um, I'm grateful to how your, you know, as a professor, your um, inclusive style of just, you know, all are welcome. And sure, I'll <laughs> tell you about this and that, you know, and um, but your your podcast, I've told someone recently, it's like a graduate class, you know, right there for anyone to hear. You know, it's it's an amazing resource. So yeah, you do it very thoughtfully, and it's at a high level. So it's a wonderful resource. Well, thank you, thank you. Yeah, so let's get to talking about your book a little bit because, as mentioned, September is. Suicide Prevention Awareness Month, and I'm hoping that um, people who are listening can get to understand a little bit more about the problem of suicide, about what we can do for prevention, and how schools and communities how schools and communities can support someone who is suicidal, and then even what to do to support the community and the school when someone does die by suicide. Yeah, and. <clears throat> You know, I'll just say that this is a terrifying topic. Yeah. It's a terrifying topic that a lot of people are talking about. And the people that tend not to talk about this topic are the professionals. <laughs> right. So, we're scared to talk about it. We're terrified to talk about it. Yeah. And, um, but the kids are talking about it. Right, especially after somebody dies by suicide, whether that's somebody they know personally or there's somebody in the media that they hear about that dies by suicide, so they're talking about it. Uh, parents are talking about it because when kids uh, get into those risky years, and when I say risky years, I mean that the the risk for suicide, uh, ideation, attempt, and death increase significantly um, after the you know about the age of ten or eleven. Um, you have parents who start talking about this and they say, what, you know, what are we going to do? What, what, what can we do? Especially those parents who had been suicidal when they were young or are currently suicidal. You know, there are, 
in, in 2014, which is the, the most recent year that we have statistics, there were uh, 42,000 suicides in the United States. Mm. There were about 16,000 homicides. Oh, my gosh. I did not know that it was a higher number than the number of homicides. That's incredible. Yeah, and, and to really put a fine point on it, you are more likely to kill yourself than to be killed by somebody else in the United States. Wow. Right? Oof, that's really a sobering statistic. Oh. Mm-hmm. It's very sobering. And um, and most of the people that kill themselves are men. And most of those are adult men. Uh, most of those are white adult men. And most of those used a gun. Mm. And if you want to significantly reduce the number of suicides in a kind of theoretical sense, what you would do is you would eliminate access to guns. Mm. And you would probably cut in half the suicide rate in the United States. Now, because it's the United States and we have the Second Amendment and the debate over what the Second Amendment means and confusion and um, politics – we're never going to get rid of the guns, right? So that's not actually a viable policy. Um, but you have a variety of intervention um, methods that are available out there that are not really on the table. And so a lot of what we do in the field of suicide prevention is we, we really start to think about what are the other things that can be done how can we keep people from getting to the point where they would want to kill themselves? Which yes, this that's idea what of, I'm always uh, saying. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, you know, there's an idea that I think is useful, whether you're an academic or a practitioner or a parent or, you know, or not a parent. Um, and it, it's called upstream prevention. Mm-hmm. And upstream prevention imagines that let's say you have uh, somebody who's uh, uh, 17 right she's a high school senior and uh, she's suicidal and and she does something to try and end her life which is what we call a suicide attempt if you rewind the tape of her life is there a point that you can pinpoint Is there a time period, is there a phase of her life that you could say, if we had done something here, it would have radically changed her trajectory so that she never would have gotten to the place where she wanted to die? And that's upstream prevention. Now, we don't know exactly what that is, and we certainly don't know that there's one thing that'll work for everybody. But one of the things that we do when we think about suicide prevention in schools is we think about it from um, a universal perspective, meaning these sorts of things would work for everybody, Mm. regardless of whether they have any sort of problems or not. Um, uh, We think about it from a kind of a a targeted perspective, right? Um, are, Are there people who have risk factors, known risk factors for suicide? So for example, substance use or, um, history of depression or family members who have killed themselves um, or a prior suicide attempt. And then, and then we, the most narrow type of intervention is those kids who, who've identified, been identified, either identified themselves or somebody else has identified them as being actually at risk for suicide. So you have those three levels. And Laura, I'm going to tell you something that's going to blow your mind. Are you ready? <laughs> oh, Okay. <laughs> I'll try. <laughs> I'm sitting down. Okay, that's good. That's good. There is something that has been shown to actually uh, reduce the likelihood that kids will kill themselves. And it's called the good behavior game. Hmm. The good behavior game has nothing to do with suicide. The Good Behavior Game is a behavior modification program that, you know, will get implemented with third graders, right? It's a, 
It's about rewards. It's about identifying good behavior. It's about rewarding kids for doing the right thing. Well, there was some researchers out of Baltimore, a town you might be familiar with, that did a study of kids who participated in the good behavior game. And they tracked these kids, um, and, and they found out that when these kids were adults, the kids that were involved in the good behavior game, compared to kids who were just the same as them but didn't participate in the good behavior game in school, that the good behavior game kids were significantly less likely to kill themselves. Mm. And there was something about being involved in you know, this uh, basically semester-long game that protected them from suicide over a 20-year period. So the good behavior game was just done for that one semester, but they saw these results even 20 years after that? Yep. Ooh, tell us more. <laughs> <laughs> Mind blown. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> No, but I, 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 you know, I'm, I, I have, I've never implemented the good behavior game, right? It's an educational game. It's for teachers. It's not for social workers or therapists. It's, it's, it's. It was developed for schools to help um, address behavioral issues in kids, and somehow, this game has managed to save people's lives, hmm. which is incredible. Yeah. Very and hopeful, so, too. It's easy. Like, hey, let's just do this game. I know. Let's do this game. Now, has it been implemented nationally? And have we been able to see this, you know, track this over 20 years? No. And that's in part one of the sort of the glacial pace of of research. Mm. On one hand, it takes a while to do research. But on the other hand, if you're looking at what are the effects of intervention A – on a person's life 20 years down the road, in order to actually do that research, you have to wait 20 years. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. You can't say, we're going to look at kids who are five now and 25 and be able to um, make a link because you're not looking at the same kids. Right. You know? Um, so, so, so this is that first part of prevention that we talk about in our book. We talk about what are the ways that we can think about um, engaging students, um, doing things in classrooms that hopefully can prevent suicide. And I, and I want to give a shout out to another school-based program. Uh, uh, a, it's uh, Jim Mazza, who is a researcher in Seattle, Washington. And he and his wife, Elizabeth, um, and they've partnered with Marsha Linehan, who develops dialectical behavior therapy, and a couple other folks. They have created a school-based curriculum of uh, DBT skills in schools. Hmm. Now, DBT has been shown to be very effective in reducing uh, suicide risk in adults. And there's some research to show that it works for adolescents. But this is a program that takes the core skills that people learn and it puts it into an educational curriculum format. And I and many others in the field of suicide prevention are very hopeful that this kind of social emotional learning that can occur in schools will actually significantly reduce suicide risk by providing all students, not just students who've already been identified at risk, but providing all students with the kinds of skills and coping mechanisms that they can rely on when they do find themselves to be suicidal or when they find themselves to be in situations that seem to lead to uh, suicidal ideation or desires to end one's life. That sounds very promising. It does. It sounds very promising. But again, you know, do we know that it works? No. We, we're going to have to wait. We're going to have to wait a long time, which is incredibly frustrating for parents who are sitting there saying, well, wait a minute. My kid is suicidal now. What do I do? Yeah. So 
Can you talk a little bit about what people can do now if their child is suicidal or what the schools and the communities can do to support that child yeah, and family? Absolutely. Um, so there are a couple of things. One of the things that schools need to do is they need to make sure that they are thinking of themselves as sort of the, the center of, of the wheel, right? They, they are at the center of this child's life. Now, if, you, if you're an outpatient therapist or you work in a hospital or you're just a parent, you might be thinking, well, why is the school the center? Well, the school is the center in part because that's where the kid spends most of their day. Mm-hmm. They're surrounded by other kids and they're surrounded by adults who are able to understand that child's behavior in a context of other children. Parents are amazing. I'm a parent, right? Uh, I'm not an amazing parent, but I'm I'm a parent, and so I know my kids well, but I don't actually know my kids well in the context of other kids. Yeah. So schools are the, really the hub, the center of suicide prevention because that's where you get to see all the highs and lows, and you get to see how they are um, – uh, either consistent with or different from what's going on with their peers at any given moment. Um, and so what schools need to do is they need to think of themselves as the hub that uh, coordinate this, the services with other providers. So community mental health, hospitals, um, primary care, all those sorts of things. And when they do that, um, either by identifying therapists in the community who know how to work with somebody who's suicidal, who, who's willing to do school visits, who can coordinate with hospitals, right? do the kinds of things that schools themselves can't do because they don't have the time or resource, then what they're doing is they're building this safety net. Um, and one of the things that schools can do with your child that is suicidal is that the schools can monitor that suicide risk. And one of the things that we developed for the book is something that we call the suicide risk monitoring form. Mm. And this is a very quick and easy, can be self-report for kids that are able to fill out forms. It can be administered um, for kids that are uh, unable to fill it out themselves. And it's the kind of thing that will allow you to um, measure suicide risk and protective factors, things that, you know, reasons why they want to live, reasons why they might not be at risk for suicide, um, and monitor that and be able to graph it and chart it over time. So if you're an outpatient therapist and you're like, oh, you know, I, I, I see this kid once a week and I'd really love to be able to get some information about how he's doing on a regular basis, um, you certainly should ask the parents, but you should also ask the school can somebody administer this survey or, you know, this risk assessment form, get some information, sign the release of information so I can get it, right? It's, it's, it's a really powerful way of tracking suicide risk over time. Okay. That's a great resource that's right in your book. It's right in the book. And we tell you how to use it. And um, anybody that buys the book can download these e-resources that are in the book and they're you know, they, they can print them out and they can use them whenever they want. We worked out with the publishers that we transfer the copyright to the purchaser of the book for all of these worksheets. That's great. Yeah. Now, some of the other resources, you know, if, you're, if, you're, if your kid is currently suicidal, um, let's say you have a, a, somebody in middle school or high school. You know, one of the things that's most terrifying for parents is the question of how – much do I get into my kid's life, right? My teenager isn't part of what my teenager is supposed to do to kind of separate him or her from him or herself from me, right? How much do I meddle in their life when I, when I try and monitor what's going on? My kid's like, quit, quit bothering me. Quit getting in my business. Yeah. Um, and they need privacy. They need privacy. But if what happens in their privacy is that they, um, do things that could end their life, then they no longer um, can have that kind of privacy. Right. And so um, this therapy, attachment-based family therapy that that I worked with has some really <laughs> amazing 
basic concepts that I think parents will find really useful. And one of those is the idea that parents need to let kids know that the kids have the right to come to the parents when they're feeling depressed or suicidal. There are a lot of things that teenagers don't need to come to parents about. It's totally fine for teenagers not to come to their parents about issues related to their peers, or maybe they've got some issues with their schools. I mean, it would be ideal if they would, but they don't have to. But if the choice is, I would rather kill myself than talk to my parents, then that is a choice that the parents need to actively work uh, to take off the table. And there's a very simple thing that parents can do, and that is, and this might sound condescending, but I don't mean it like this, is to listen to your kid, to validate their experience, which is not to say that you agree with it, it's just to validate that you get that they are feeling that way, and to give them the space to talk about what's going on. So if a kid's like, well, I don't want to come talk to you because every time I, every time I come talk to you, you just tell me, oh, you're an amazing kid. It'll get better. Well, of course, the kid hears that, and basically the kid's saying to himself, well, my mom doesn't get me because I just told her I'm in pain, and she said, but it'll be fine. Don't worry about it. She's totally blown me off. So instead – you do what a therapist does, which is say, so it sounds like you're pretty miserable. Tell me more. Right? That's the special sauce. That is what makes it so simple. It's not easy, but it's simple. You say, tell me more. You, you label their emotions. Ah, oh, you, sound, you sound so sad. You sound so lonely right now. You sound really angry. Tell me more. Yeah, I could see why you would be so frustrated with me and, you know, your dad. Cuz Cause, cause we we didn't. We weren't there for you. Yeah. So tell me more about that. Right? It's that idea that you get the kid to talk and suddenly they're like, "Oh. Wait, I can talk to my parents." And they get it. And you know, at 2 in the morning when they have the option of doing something to end their life or texting their friends who might not be able to manage um what's going on, they can, they can go next door and knock on their parents' door and be like, I, I don't think I can make it through the night. They're like, okay, you seem really miserable. Tell me more. Yeah, you, you, you talk about how simple that is, and yet it's so hard for some of us to talk about emotions. And I think, you know, even culturally, it's just not really encouraged to express in that way. So we may think we're being supportive by saying, um, you know, well, just put that behind you and just, you know, tomorrow's a new day. Just try to forget about it. You know, I, people always say in therapy how hurtful it is when they try to go to someone with their emotional experience and they're told, you know, well, just try to forget about it. Try not to think about it because the person's saying, I don't want to know how you feel. I just want you to stop feeling that way. Yes. Yeah, that's exactly right. So that, that one point that you just made is so important. I think um, for people really to kind of, put a frame around that that's really really important mm -hmm. yeah and also it's okay for parents to um to reach out to their friends you know again this is the kind of thing where there's this fear of talking about it maybe the fear from the parent is i will be seen as a bad parent mm -hmm. right um or this facade that i perpetuate on facebook is going to come crumbling down when they find out that you know, that absolutely deliriously beautiful profile picture that I have um, is a complete lie. <laughs> and currently my life is a disaster and my kid wants to kill himself. And my partner and I are just fighting, you know, like cats and dogs. And my kids are confused because nobody knows what's going on. Right? That's embarrassing. It's shameful. But, you know, if we can't connect with our, our community and our, our friends and our, 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 uh, our supports as adults – this gets really, really hard. Yeah. 
Now, in your book is um, brief attachment focused family therapy. Is that the right? Yeah, attachment based family therapy, ABFT. Yep. Okay. Is it is it described in the book? Because I know. Yep, um, it is. That intervention's out there, but I don't. I certainly know in my community, it's not one that's like just every therapist knows how to do. No, and in fact, they wouldn't. And again, this is the glacial pace of th- of research. So ABFT has um, research support, but um, in terms of training therapists, they're still in their early days. Yeah, they're they're you know a couple dozen trained you know certified therapists around the world, um, and they're ramping up trainings across the country. But uh, you can certainly learn more about ABFT in the book. And on my podcast, I interviewed uh, Guy Diamond and Suzanne Levy, two of the co-developers, about it. And so that's another resource. I'll be going right to there after we finish. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Okay, so um, I don't know if you have more to say about how to support a suicidal kid or if you want to move to what to do when someone does die by suicide. Well, what I will say is that I have scratched the surface yeah. about supporting kids who are suicidal. Um, and uh, uh, but, but the take-home message for parents is um, – I know that you want to be there for your kids and it's incredibly painful to not know how to be there in the right way. Um, But uh, putting yourself out there and saying, I might not have done this right in the past, but I want to do it right now. Tell me more is is a great place to start. And you can't go wrong by doing that. Yeah, and when you're talking to a teenager and you admit that you made a mistake before, you get a lot of respect from them for doing that. Absolutely. And and parents are terrified because they're like, oh, no, I lose all my power. But in fact, they have the power to begin with and acknowledging that um, they're not all powerful is, is a way of gaining that respect. Yeah. 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 Um, so, so briefly, some things that can happen in schools after a suicide death. Um, and here's another fun fact. <laughs> the person in the school that's most likely to die by suicide, do you know who that is? Mm, the kid who gets bullied? It's a teacher. Oh, my gosh. It's a white adult male, probably in his 50s who may or may not be uh, in a relationship, right? That is, the, that is the person who is actually at greatest risk for suicide, statistically. Mm. Um, now, in any given school, you know, there's no telling. But, um, but let's say that that teacher does kill himself, or let's say that a student kills uh, himself in school, right, or herself. I'm just going to say him or her, just to make it easy. Um, the, the thing that has to happen is that the school has to have already established a crisis plan before the suicide. And that crisis plan has to include a whole bunch of things. Some of the main ones have to do with assigning staff members to know how to manage the media, right? How are you going to uh, talk to reporters who might call the school? What if there are reporters that come to the school how are you going to keep them separate from the students? For the students, who's going to be responsible for providing emotional support? How are you going to support the staff who might be grieving the loss of either their colleague or a student? How do you deal with social media? Right? It used to be that somebody died by suicide, the principal got a phone call, the principal and the staff got together, they figured out how to draft a memo, maybe there was a letter or some sort of announcement, um, and that's how people learned about it. Today, <laughs> if there's a kid that dies by suicide, who's the first people that know about it? Twitter. The kids. Exactly. It's other kids. Yeah. Suddenly, the schools are the last ones to know. And God forbid the family's like, we don't want this to be called a suicide. But 
you know, people are snap, kids are Snapchatting, they're Instagramming, they're tweeting. Um, it's on Facebook, and and the family and the school have completely lost control of the message. Essentially, Twitter, social media becomes a PA announcement. Yeah, which is the worst way to announce a suicide death. And it's the worst way because there's no way to monitor people's reactions to that. Now, one of the things that's important for folks to know is that research done by David Brent and his colleagues many years ago at this point found that um, if, if you take a group of kids who are at risk for suicide, maybe they might be depressed, maybe they've had thoughts of suicide in the past, and one of their friends dies by suicide – the kids that are the closest to the deceased kid are actually less likely to be suicidal than the kids who are one level removed. Mm. Now, this sort of flies in the face of logic. Wouldn't you think that the kids that are closest to the person that died by suicide, the ones that are going to be most at risk? It doesn't seem to be the case, and the reason why seems to be that those closest can see the pain and suffering that's caused by a suicide and that that in and of itself makes them think twice about doing something to end their life. But those that are one or two steps removed, they don't see the pain and the suffering that it causes others. They might see the memorials or the remembrances or everybody gathering around saying, oh, well, you know, Stephanie was such a great person, right? All the things that people are not saying about them right now. And so they're more likely to kill themselves. And so what I always tell kids is, um, and adults, is I say, you know, suicide doesn't end the pain. It just gives it to everybody else. And that idea that when you die by suicide, everybody suffers is one of the ideas that's important to put out there. Now, when people are suffering, as in the case of a death by suicide in a school, it's important to have these emotional supports in place. If you have a staff member, let's like say there was a teacher who was uh, really close to the kid who died, the school needs to step in and say, we are going to support you to be able to take care of yourself. It could look like taking a couple of days off, a couple you know, weeks, whatever it needs to be. And I know this is tough for school districts, but giving the teacher or the social worker an opportunity to feel like they have a little bit of control in what they're doing and how they're taking care of themselves on an organizational level is actually one of the best ways to prevent burnout. So there are a lot of things that, that need to happen when somebody dies by suicide in a school. And some of those have to do with taking care of the students, taking care of the staff, managing social media managing traditional media. We go into a whole thing in the book about this crisis planning. We also walk you through what to do in the first 24 hours after a suicide death. Well, the book is a wonderful resource, I have no doubt. And so the book is called Suicide in Schools, A Practitioner's Guide. And it's for school administrators, teachers, social workers, school counselors, Anyone in that, you know, who interacts with kids. Yeah, and if you are um, an outpatient therapist, you can read this book and say, oh, wait, does my school do this? If you're a parent, you can buy the book and say, oh, does my kid's school do this? And if they don't, I'm going to set up a meeting and talk to somebody to find out, well, why don't you? Um, this book, I'm very proud to say, has been um, – presented at uh, uh, state-level congressional uh, proceedings around suicide prevention grants, school-based suicide prevention, and held up and said, you know, this is a book that really outlines what we should do. Um, and, and that's why we wrote it. And so even though it's called Suicide in Schools, people have said that it is a book that uh, folks um, outside of uh, the school uh, arena find useful. Well, that's wonderful. I wish we had more time to talk about your book today, but I'm, I am going to go over and listen to your podcast episode um, to learn more. And 
um, pick up the book too. <laughs> <laughs> That's excellent. You know, I, and and right now, for whatever reason, I think it's Suicide Prevention Month. It is actually on deep discount um, from the Routledge website. Oh, good. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And so, how um, how can people find your podcast and the other stuff you're doing? So you can go to um, Google and type in Social Work Podcast, or you can go to socialworkpodcast.com. It's an easy way. You can go to iTunes. It's also uh, on Google Music under okay. podcasts, which is totally clunky and cumbersome these days. And I really hope that they work that out a little bit. Um, the uh, podcast is also on the Stitcher mobile app, where you can get the latest 10 episodes, which given the irregular irregularity of my posting could uh, – uh, work for you for a good 18 months worth of episodes. Um, and um, if you're interested in any of my research or other stuff, you can go to Loyola University Chicago and just search for Jonathan Singer and you can get my official faculty page. Awesome. Jonathan, thank you so much for being on Therapy Chat today. I've really enjoyed our conversation. I think it's going to be really helpful and I'm excited because I'm releasing it today. <laughs> suicide prevention awareness month so you'll That's be able amazing. to listen right away that's great laura thank you so much for inviting me i really appreciate it to make a donation to team nick go to my fundraising page for team nick which you can access in the show notes for this episode it's okay if you don't make the donation before september 24th the page will remain open and i appreciate any donations that you make this is my way of supporting my friend and honoring her brother, who I had never met, but I know he was a wonderful person, and her love for him really shines, and that's why I wanted to do this today. Here in my community, we have a big problem with suicide. It's happening way more often than it should be, and we need to talk about it. I think this book, Suicide in Schools, A Practitioner's Guide, would be a very useful addition to our school system because just trying to identify who might be suicidal and talking them out of it in that moment is not enough. We have to start way sooner. So I'm really grateful that Jonathan took the time to talk with me today, and I hope that you will be inspired to take some action in your community. As always, thank you for listening to Therapy Chat, and I would love for you to go over to iTunes and leave a rating and review and subscribe so you can get all the latest episodes as soon as they come out. Thank you for listening to the Therapy Chat Podcast with Laura Reagan, LCSWC. For more information, visit Laura's website at www.lcswc.com. Laura Reagan, LCSWC.com.